I heard about a, a man who got really worried every time that he had to get on an airplane and fly somewhere. And so on this certain day, he was at the airport, he was scheduled to go on a business trip halfway across the country, and the guy was getting really, really nervous, especially because the weather was bad and his flight was delayed. So there the poor guy is, pacing back and forth across the terminal. His palms are sweaty, his heart is racing, he's got this pit in his stomach, and the guy is just so filled with anxiety and worry, he can't even stand it. Well, as he's pacing back and forth, he sees a vending machine that looked a little bit out of place. He walked up to it and saw that it was a life insurance vending machine at the airport. And basically it boiled down to this. He could buy a policy for, to cover him for his upcoming flight. And it would give $100,000 to his family if the plane he's about to board crashes and he dies. <laughs> and so the guy looks at the price, it's 20 bucks, and he says, you know what, this is a really good investment, so I'm going to pay 20 bucks and get this life insurance policy. He puts his 20 bucks in the machine, the policy comes out, the guy starts feeling a little better, he goes to a nearby Panda Express, has his two item combo, he's starting to calm down until he cracks open his fortune cookie. And he reads the fortune in the fortune cookie and this is what it said, your recent investment will pay big dividends. <laughs> this poor guy, <laughs> he just knew he was going to die on that airplane. Uh, as you might imagine, five minutes passes, he's pacing back and forth faster than ever, his heart's racing faster than ever, his palms are sweaty, and the pit in his stomach is bigger than ever. Well, Jesus turns to us today as his followers, and he says, don't worry. Do not worry worry. I was going to call today's sermon, Don't Worry, but that seemed a little too simple. So I decided to do something I've never done. I've given this sermon today a title in Swahili. And so today's message is called Hakuna Matata. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, make sure you're in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be in verse 25, and we will finish the chapter, Lord willing, this morning, 25 through verse 34. I'll be reading out of the New International Version, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or uh, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May God bless us as we study his word today and more importantly, as we apply it to our lives. Well, in case you and I miss Jesus' main point in these 10 verses, he repeats himself five times, five times. Look at verse 25. He says, do not worry about your life. Then in verse 27, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? Verse 28, why do you worry about clothes? Verse 31, do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Look at verse 34, do not worry about tomorrow. I kind of get the impression that Jesus doesn't want us to worry, don't you? He doesn't want us to worry, but we ask the question, why not? What's the big deal? It's just part of life, isn't it? Why doesn't Jesus want us to worry? And our minds start to guess as to why he may, might not want us to worry. Maybe he doesn't want us to worry because he realizes it'll take a negative toll on our health. 
could lead to high blood pressure. It could lead to hypertension, heart issues, gastrointestinal issues. And maybe he says, don't worry because he knows we'll lose sleep if we're worrying too much. Maybe he says, uh, don't worry because he knows we won't be fun to be around and others won't want to be around us because we're a worry wart. Well, those things are all true, but that's not the main reason why Jesus says, do not worry. And so as we dive into this passage and look at it a little closer and dig a little deeper over the next few minutes together, we're going to see how Jesus answered this question, why shouldn't you and I worry? Let's start with the very first word in verse 25. Jesus starts verse 25 with that wonderful word, therefore. Remember, I always point out to you, when you see that word therefore in scripture, you've got to ask a very important question. And that question goes like this. What is the therefore, therefore? So let's ask that question together regarding verse 25. What is the therefore, therefore? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. Well, let's answer that question. Why is it there? In order to answer that question, we have to take another look at that prior passage, the passage we looked at last week. What has Jesus just gotten through saying? Well, Jesus got, just got through saying in verses 19 and 20, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus just got through saying in verse 21, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And that verse that precedes the word therefore, in verse 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So I don't want you to miss this. Verses 24 and 25 go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. And so I would say it this way. You cannot understand what Jesus is telling you in verse 25 unless you understand what Jesus is telling you in verse 24. And you cannot properly live out verse 24 unless you live out what he is telling you in verse 25. These two verses, 24 and 25, go hand in hand. So, what is Jesus saying in verse 24? Well, remember he said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus makes it very clear in verse 24. We're going to look at this in some ways even more directly than we did last week. Look at verse 24 and see if you agree with me here. In verse 24, doesn't Jesus say plainly, if you serve money, you can't serve God? Do you see that there in verse 24? There's really no debate on that. He says it pretty plainly, doesn't he? He also says in verse 24, if you love money, you will hate God. Do you see how he says that in verse 24? And then also in verse 24, he says, if you are devoted to money, you will despise God. I would say to you that those three statements are not up for debate. Jesus clearly says those three things right there in verse 24. These three statements are true. And the opposite of these three statements is equally true. Jesus says very plainly in verse 24, if you serve God, you can't serve money. If you love God, you will hate money. If you are devoted to God, you will despise money. And so he makes it very clear you can't have one without the other. And we say, okay, well, Jesus says that if we're going to love God the Father, we have to hate money and we have to despise money. But what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to hate and despise money? Well, let me answer that question with another question. Have you ever attended a church that said they were never going to take an offering and the pastor would get up and say, we hate money here. So don't you pull out your wallets or purses. We don't want your money. We hate money here. We're not going to take an offering. Have you ever been to a church like that? <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Why not? Because Jesus obviously doesn't mean here that we're never to touch money, uh, never to use money, spend money, or to get money in a paycheck. He's 
Certainly not saying that. So what is he saying? Well, this is touching on something we did make very clear last week in last week's message. Our hearts must never be all wrapped up in our money and material possessions. Instead, our hearts should be all wrapped up in God and his kingdom work. Amen? So Jesus isn't saying hate money from the standpoint of never deal with money. He's saying make sure that your heart is not wrapped up in your money and your material possessions. Instead, make sure your heart's wrapped up in God and his kingdom work. Do you remember the conversation Jesus had with his 12 disciples after he had just spoken to the woman at the well in John chapter 4? You, you remember the story probably. Uh, Jesus is passing with his disciples through Samaria. They've been hoofing it on foot all morning long. They've probably been walking for hours. And so they get to this well in Samaria at high noon. And so they're hungry and they're tired and they're thirsty there in the heat of the day. And so Jesus' 12 disciples go into the nearby town to buy some lunch. And so there Jesus is striking up a conversation uh, with a woman that didn't have the greatest reputation. Uh, she had been married to five different men, had divorced all five of them, and was currently shacking up with some guy. And so Jesus is talking to a woman that in all likelihood was an outcast in her own community. And so Jesus is talking to her, and he's sharing Christ with her, man. He's leading her uh, to salvation. And so the 12 disciples come back, and you remember how surprised they were when they see Jesus finishing up a conversation uh, with this skanky woman. You know, they would have never talked to this woman. Uh, they couldn't believe their rabbi was doing it. And so remember this conversation Jesus has with the disciples. They come up to him and they say, Rabbi, eat something. And you remember what Jesus said in response? He said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. <laughs> well, that completely baffled his disciples. They turned to each other and asked, could someone else have brought him food? You know, they're scratching their heads. They can't understand what he's talking about. Then Jesus tells them plainly, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What was Jesus getting at? Jesus was saying that food was evil, right? No, that's not at all what he was saying. Jesus was saying any follower of his needs to hate food and to hate taking a nap in the afternoon and to hate water when you're thirsty. Obviously, no. Jesus wasn't saying any of those things. What Jesus was saying Thankfully, because I like food and I like water when I'm thirsty and I really like afternoon naps. He wasn't saying we should hate those things. He was simply pointing out that his physical needs were not a priority for him in that moment. Because the Samaritan woman's spiritual needs were so much more pressing. Or to say it another way, Jesus wasn't worried about eating lunch or taking a nap because he was preoccupied with doing God's work. From his perspective, eating or napping would be a waste of time at a moment when a lost and dying woman was getting saved. Wouldn't you agree with that? Jesus wasn't saying that food was bad. It's not like they brought back Del Taco and he says, man, Del Taco is terrible. I wanted Taco Bell. No, not that at all. They brought back food that was fine for Jesus to eat. The water from the well was fine to drink, and he probably wanted a nap. But those things were so far less of a priority than leading this woman to Christ, who desperately needed Christ. So don't miss what Jesus is saying in verse 25. If we fuse these two verses together, verses 24 and 25, this is what Jesus is saying. Therefore... Okay, what is the therefore, therefore? It's there for this reason. Therefore, if you have chosen to serve God instead of serving money, and you've chosen to love God instead of loving all the stuff in your house and garage, and you've chosen to be devoted to God instead of being devoted to your stomach, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? And the unspoken answer to Jesus' question is yes. Absolutely. Life in the kingdom of heaven is infinitely more important than food and our bodies in the kingdom of heaven are infinitely more important than clothing. Jesus makes it clear, oh, these things that we need in this life are not bad. 
But the work of God and advancing his kingdom is such a higher priority. Remember what we talked about two weeks ago as we studied Jesus' teaching on fasting. I really tried to drill home this point two weeks ago. Fasting is part of a radical reorientation to God. Honestly, the entire Sermon on the Mount is a, re, uh, is a radical reorientation to God. I, I want you to think about some of what we've learned so far. Remember the very first beatitude. The very first beatitude in chapter 5. The world says, blessed are the rich in spirit. And Jesus says, oh no, blessed are are the poor in spirit. The world says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for fame and fortune. And Jesus says, oh no, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, Jesus uh, says, come to to, to me, those of you who want to get right with God and expand the kingdom of God. The world says, no, 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 uh, that's not what we're about. The world says, hallowed be my name. And uh, Jesus teaches us to pray, hallowed be the Father's name. The world says, my kingdom come and my will be done. But Jesus teaches us to pray, no, Father, your kingdom come and your will be done. Most people in the world serve and love and are devoted to material things. But Jesus turns to us and says, you as my followers are to be radically different. You are to serve your Father in heaven. You are to love your Father in heaven. And you are to be completely devoted to your Father in heaven. And so throughout this entire Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is doing this radical reorientation to reorient our focus and our priorities and the way that we live from the world's way to God's way. Jesus calls us to take our eyes off all the stuff around us and reorient ourselves to God. And if we are reoriented to God, There is no place in our lives for worrying about food or water or clothes or even tomorrow's utility bills. And to that, I say, amen. Amen. Notice Jesus' lesson in verse 25. As followers of Christ, we are part of heaven's invasion of planet Earth. So for us, life is more important than food and the body is much more important than clothes, right? We are carrying out the greatest mission in history. So in verse 25, we have this lesson. We have much more pressing matters to deal with today than what we're going to eat for lunch or whether our next pair of shoes should be a pair of Nikes or a pair of Reeboks. So Jesus says, don't worry about food and clothes. Notice Jesus' lesson in verse 26. You've never seen a severely undernourished bird, have you? No, I haven't either. Every bird you've ever seen out there in nature has some meat on its bones, right? And so Jesus points to the bird and says, you know what? That bird is just a little silly bird, but it's got meat on its bones, doesn't it? And it doesn't have meat on its bones because it's collecting all this food for the next three months in barns. Every single day, that little bird has to go out and find some food, and it's not living in worry and anxiety because I'm taking care of each and every little bird. So Jesus says, think about it. You're far more valuable to God than a raven or a pigeon. So if God makes sure they have enough food, he will certainly make sure that you have enough food. So don't worry about food. He'll make sure that you're taken care of. Notice in Jesus's lesson in verse 27, worry is completely pointless is what that verse boils down to. There's no point in worrying. Your worrying won't make your life longer. In fact, there's a really good chance it'll make your life shorter. Your worry won't make your life happier. In fact, it'll probably do the opposite. It'll rob you of happiness from day to day. So I heard about a certain husband that was really just getting up to here with his wife that was worrying all the time about everything. And so one day he confronted her and said, Honey, why are you always worried about everything? You're anxious and worried about everything. Why do you do that? It doesn't do any good. And she turned and she waved her finger in his face and she said, It does so do good. 90% of the stuff I worry about never happens. (laughs) Isn't that right? She's right. 90% of the stuff she's worrying about never happens. 
But it doesn't happen because of a worry, right? Worry has nothing to do with causing something to happen or not happen. It's going to happen regardless. Why even worry about it? Well, sometimes we're like that. We somehow think that worrying makes a difference in the problems that come our way, but it doesn't. In fact, when we worry about something, you've probably discovered this nine times out of 10, when you worry about something that's going to happen tomorrow and you have this doomsday vision in your mind of how bad it's going to be, nine times out of 10, it's not nearly as bad as you worry it's going to be. And Jesus knows that. So he says, do not worry. Warren Wearsby, I think, says it really well. He says, worrying about tomorrow does not help either tomorrow or today. If anything, it robs us of our effectiveness today, which means we will be even less effective tomorrow. That's true, isn't it? <laughs> if it's robbing you of your effectiveness today, you're going to be less effective tomorrow because of your worry today. That's true. It is right to plan for the future and even to save for the future. We find that in 2 Corinthians 12 and other places in the New Testament. But it is a sin to worry about the future and to permit tomorrow to rob today of its blessings. That's really well said. Jesus points out in verse 27 that worry is completely pointless, so don't worry about material things. Well, notice what Jesus te teaches us in verses 28 through 30. Have you ever noticed that a weed growing through a crack in your driveway is oftentimes greener than the lawn you have to slave over to keep green? That's been a, a point of frustration for me for many years. I like having a lawn in my front yard and it, it just irks me to no end that I put all of that money into watering that lawn and aerating that lawn and mowing that lawn and that silly weed coming out of a crack in my driveway is more green than my lawn is. Why is that? Because God even cares about that little weed, right? Why is the, the lily out there in the field that Jesus reminds us of? Why is that wildflower out in the field? Why is it more beautiful than the flowers we try to grow in our own gardens? Because God's taking care of that wildflower, flower, right? And so Jesus is pointing out, I take care of the grass of the field. I take care of the lilies of the valley. In fact, those lilies look better than Solomon ever did in his finest outfit. He takes care of them. And he says, why do you worry about what you're going to wear? Oh, you of little faith. Notice those five very important words in verse 30. O oh, you of little faith. What is Jesus saying? I believe he's saying this. Worry demonstrates a lack of faith in God. Therefore, worry is a sin. Whatever we do in unbelief is a sin. Distrusting God is a sin. Now, how does worry demonstrate a sinful lack of faith in God? Well, let me boil it down to this. Worry demonstrates a lack of trust in three things regarding God's character. First of all, worry demonstrates a lack of trust in God's love. Think about it. When you worry, the implication is God doesn't care about my needs. Why are you worrying about it? If God's promised he's going to take care of your needs. Well, I'm not convinced that he truly does care. So worry implies that God is not as loving as he claims to be. Secondly, worry also implies that there's an issue with God's wisdom. It implies God doesn't know what he's doing. You know what? How did you leave me in this mess, God? You completely screwed this one up. There's that implication when you worry. And then thirdly, there's an implication in regard to God's power. It implies when we worry, God isn't able to provide for me. Would you agree with those three statements there? There are these three implications when we as followers of Jesus Christ worry. We're even without understanding or realizing it, saying, God, I doubt your love. God, I doubt your wisdom. And God, I doubt your power. So is worry a sin? Yes, it is. It's a sin to distrust his love and distrust his wisdom and distrust his power. And that's exactly what you're doing when you worry. When you worry, you're distrusting God's love, distrusting God's wisdom, and distrusting God's power. So Jesus turns to us in verses 28 through 30 and says, trust God and don't worry. Notice Jesus' lesson in verse 32 
uh, pagans, as he calls them, we could call them non-believers. Uh, I like to sometimes refer to them as atheists. Uh, their hearts are filled with worry because their hearts are all wrapped up in food and refreshments and clothes. And you know what? When you think about it, it's perfectly in character for an atheist to worry a lot. It makes sense because they don't believe in God. So when it comes to food, when it comes to clothing, when it comes to their next paycheck, it's sink or swim. It's going to come from them or nothing else, right? And so God's not going to come through for them because they don't believe in God. And so they don't believe in God. They don't believe in heaven. So it's not like, hey, you know what? If I go without down here, no problem because I'll have eternity to enjoy the greatest blessings in the universe. There's none of that with an atheist. So, you know, well, they got to get it all done today because they may die tomorrow and then they're going to go into nothingness. And so in their minds, it is natural to worry because it's all up to them. But Jesus says, don't live like an atheist. Don't live like an atheist. Uh, Jesus has been leading us through a radical reorientation to God. He points out here in verse 32 that if our hearts are chasing after food and beverages and clothing and other stuff of this world, then we're living like pagans. We're living like atheists. We could say it this way, if our hearts are chasing after the stuff of this world and we're all anxious and worried about the stuff of this world, then we're practical atheists. We might believe in God, but in our day-to-day -day lives, we don't really trust in God. Our focus and our worries are no different than those of an atheist. Jesus says to us, don't run after the stuff of this world like an atheist. Don't worry about the stuff of this world like an atheist. Trust God and don't worry. Notice Jesus' lesson in verse 33. This is one of the most important verses in this entire passage. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. So what is Jesus saying? Is he saying, don't care so much about stuffing your face? <laughs> yeah. Is he saying, you know what? You shouldn't prioritize shopping for clothes? Yeah, he's saying that too. Is he saying, you know what? I don't want you to chase after fame and fortune. Yes, he's saying that as well. He's telling us we need to care about what God cares about. We are to prioritize what God wants us to prioritize, his kingdom and his righteousness. And instead of chasing after fame and fortune, he says, seek right relationships with God and people instead. Remember, that's what righteousness means. It means to do what is right, particularly to do what is right in your relationships. And if you do, catch this, if your priorities are straight, if you are, your heart's affections and your thoughts are realigned toward God and his kingdom work, God will supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. If you're doing kingdom work, God will meet every need that you have guaranteed. Amen? Guaranteed. A recently licensed pilot was flying his private plane on a really cloudy day and he had never landed his plane on a runway simply by using his instruments. He had always been able to see through that windshield the runway. Well, on this cloudy day, he couldn't see the runway. So he started to freak out. And he didn't trust his instruments. So he's on the horn with the air traffic controller. And the air traffic controller is trying to walk him through the landing instructions to give him a safe landing on that runway that he couldn't see. And so as he's freaking out to that air traffic controller, the air traffic controller interrupts him. And with a stern voice, he says across that radio this. He says, you just obey instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. Isn't that good? You just obey instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. Oh, we have a tendency in our day-to-day -day lives to say, oh no, my refrigerator is almost empty. I don't have any food in there for next Friday. Oh no, my kids are going to need new shoes next month and I don't have money for them. Help, my gas bill is due next week. Help, I, I need to see the dentist for this tooth that's killing me and, and I've got to see him next month and I don't have the money to see him next month. Dentists are expensive. Oh, and 
We worry about not having money today for our bills due tomorrow, and we worry about not having at the end of the week money we need for what we have to buy next week, and we're worried about next week not having the money we need for next month. And what does Jesus say? Jesus turns to us and says sternly, you just obey my instructions, I'll take care of the obstructions. I'll take care of those. And here are my instructions. Seek first the Father's kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things, the food, the clothing, the kids' shoes, the dentist bill, all these things will be given to you as well. Hmm. Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I love this insight from John Newton, a Christian man lived in the 1800s. He's the one who's famous for writing the words to amazing grace. John Newton once wrote, I compare the troubles which we have to undergo in the course of the year to a great bundle of sticks, far too large for us to lift. But God does not require us to carry the whole at once. He mercifully unties the bundle and he gives us first just one stick, which we are to carry today, and then another, which we are to carry tomorrow, and so on. This we might easily manage if we would only take the burden appointed for us each day. But instead, we choose to increase our troubles by carrying yesterday's stick over again today and adding tomorrow's burden to our load today before we are required to bear it. That's a great way to look at it, isn't it? There's this huge bundle of sticks, all the stuff you have to do in your lifetime, and Jesus just says, lift one stick at a time. Just focus on what I have for you today, to do today. Just focus on the problems that you have to deal with today. And you and I will take care of tomorrow's problems tomorrow. But don't bring them into today. You focus on today. One day at a time, people. One day at a time. Focus on God and his kingdom work. Carry the burden that he has for you to carry today. And don't worry about tomorrow. Your loving, wise, and powerful Father in heaven already has the plan for tomorrow taken care of. He's got it. It's, it's in his hands. He's going to deal with it just fine. He has the love and the wisdom and the power to deal perfectly with all the stuff that is in our lives to deal with today and all the stuff that we'll need to deal with tomorrow. So do not worry. Trust God and put your faith in him. He's got this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for that truth. You've got this. Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, we would allow you to take care of the obstructions that are coming our way today and the obstructions that will come our way tomorrow and the day after that and next week and next month and next year. May we not worry about those obstructions because that's not our job. Our job is to follow your instructions. Lord, life is not complicated. You've called us to trust you, to love you, and to obey you. And Lord, I pray that this week that we would obey your command to seek first your kingdom, to expand your kingdom in our little corner of the world, to seek your righteousness, to build a right and better relationship with you and with those around us, and as we seek you and your kingdom and your righteousness, Lord, we will trust you that all these things shall be given to us as well in due time. You are such a good, good father. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never made a decision to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, what are you waiting for? You're going through life with all this anxiety and this worry and it's all on you because Jesus right there in front of you 
You've not given him an opportunity to take your burden. You know what Jesus says? He says, take my burden. Take my yoke because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, his burden is much smaller and lighter than the burden you've been carrying around. He wants to help shoulder that heavy burden. You can't go through this life successfully on your own and you certainly can't enter heaven on your own. You've got to turn to Jesus Christ. And if you want to do that today, it's not complicated. We share the ABCs. A, admit that you are a sinner and you need the Savior. B, believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And C, choose to follow him from this point forward for the rest of your life. If you want to make that decision today, we'd love for you to reach out by text or phone to one of our prayer counselors. Their numbers are on the bottom of your screen. Would you reach out to them right now? Let them know you want to get right with Christ. Or if you just need prayer, let them know you want to be prayed for. Maybe you've made a decision to accept Christ but haven't been baptized yet. Reach out to them. Let them know, hey, I want to set up a time to get baptized. I need to do that. And we'd love to help you with that decision. Even if we need to bring the baptistry to your house, we'd love to help with that decision. Well, we're so glad that you joined us in worship today. Uh, we're going to close the service in just a few moments by taking communion. Uh, for those of you who are believers and followers of Christ who would like to take communion with us, uh, if you won't be joining us for communion today, I want to say God bless you as you seek Christ's kingdom and his righteousness this week. Trust him. Be at peace because he's got all of those needs that you have already taken care of. God bless you as you serve the Lord this week. We'll see you next Sunday.